The Voice of Reason Broadcast Network presents The Orthodox Nationalist. Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson is a former professor of Russian and Ukrainian history and philosophy, an Orthodox priest, and a theorist of nationalism and agrarianism. And now, here's Matt. It is my pleasure today. We have had uh, our guest a couple of times on the Antipodean Hour. My guest today is um, uh, Father um, Matthew Raphael Johnson, who is uh, a priest after the uh, uh, Russian Orthodox tradition. He'll probably correct me on that in just a moment. Uh, Father Matt was originally um, an editor. He has been an editor of the Barnes Review, an historical magazine, hosts his own program on recent radio network, has authored many articles on, um, uh, particularly on uh, uh, Eastern philosophy, Russian philosophy, is a a man of, uh, 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 whose worldview is probably almost exactly identical with mine. We haven't probably talked much about theology, though we're going to dabble in this interesting area today. Uh, Father Matt, how are you today? I'm doing fine. I really appreciate you having me on. I know that you have to get up super early to deal with me, and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I do appreciate that. It's, it's no dealing with you. It's a pleasure. I'm, I always, I'm, I'm almost giddy like a girl every time I get to talk to you. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, no, I'm not aware of that, uh, but, uh, you know, you and Rick Adams are my two favorite radio hosts out there, and it's really, it's really in terms of attitude and how you approach, basic bedside manner, and that's pretty rare these days. Hmm. Well, I guess it is, and I guess the problem is when you have a, a, a call-in type environment, uh, it, it, it can tilt and it, it can tilt a, a discussion quickly away. Um, some people who do call in programs, they'll, they'll say to the guest, the guest will say, we won't do call in, we'll take messages by email. But even then, uh, yeah, Rick Adams is a nice nature. He's got a, he's kind of a, a soft hearted guy. How long have you been doing interviews with him? Oh, for years. Uh, he was our, uh, master of cer- ceremonies at the Barnes Review Conference. In D.C. in 2001, I think, and and ever since okay. then we've been uh, we've been very good friends. Um, well, so I've been go. on his show maybe two, two or three times a year normally. But I, I I I'm with you. I don't like call in. Uh, I don't care what people think. And normally, you know, <laughs> it's it's usually completely often. You know, it's about them. It's about them wanting to sound intelligent. It's never really about. Anything concerning the topic, and and uh, I I think really it's it's destructive. Uh, the last couple of times I was with Rick Adams, we didn't take calls at all. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the idea would be um, if you knew if you had a, a, a bit of vetting, and then of course then then the oh it's all about me caller gets offended, and then he's calling the network, and then it's pressure, pressure, pressure. But we we try to do that. Uh, we try to avoid pressure as much as possible here, and. Um, uh, we've had a couple of good programs. We have one coming up um, in a in a month or so, where we're going to look at social theory and look at uh, distributism, subsidiarity, and um, social credit, and that should be interesting. But today, I want to talk about um, uh, asceticism and the ascetic uh, um, lifestyle and kind of the metaphysics, perhaps as the Orthodox see it. But I know that you're you really are uh, have studied more than just the Orthodox tradition, but also the Catholic and the Protestant tradition. So, um, Father Matt, I'd like to begin by reading a a segment and getting your comments on it. Something I thought just about the knowledge of God, and um, uh, and we'll go from here. Just as an opener, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I I don't know if you're aware of it, but the world stinks. It's just pretty disgusting out there. And in my own heart is a longing to find a peaceful place. It's a longing to find to find a solace and something where I could say that I can walk hand in hand with my Savior and with my Redeemer. And, um, and so I've begun to do some reading into, uh, in, into what some of the, the, um, men and women in the past, how they've seen God. And I just picked something up here, um, that, um, uh, uh, talks about God in his nature. He is above any idea. 
and any name above all definitions, above mind, essence, and knowledge. It is impossible to feel, imagine, comprehend, or name him. The inner divine life is entirely concealed from created scrutiny and exceeds any measure which is accessible to or can be accommodated by any by created reason. But this does not mean that God is far removed from the world or that he conceals himself from reasoning spirits. God is revealed and acts and is present in creatures. A creature exists and abides and lives by virtue of this divine omnipresence. God is present in the world, not in his own essence which always remains unattainable, unknowable, and ineffable, but in his works and his goodness, which come from the incommunicable God as an abundant current and which gives communion to that which exists. He abides in the world in his creative emanations and his beneficial providences, in his powers and his energies. In his self-revelation to the world, God is cognizable and comprehensible. This means God is comprehensible only through revelation. I've got this from um, Holy Trinity Mission is one of the many things I've been reading where it talks about um, some of the traditional Eastern um, uh, theological views of God. Uh, have you got any comments on that statement, Father Matt? Uh, it's sort of a, it, it's, it's really the cliche understanding of, of the Orthodox uh, philosophy. It's the uh, metaphysics and, and understanding of the Greek church fathers, uh, St. Basil and Athanasius in particular, Gregory of Nyssa, Ephraim the Siri, and many others. Uh, it's, it's, you know, what you just read is, is classic. It, it's the classic um, synopsis of what the ancient uh, pre-Nicene and post-Nicene fathers said about God the Father, uh, God the Son, and then uh, how the Holy Spirit completes the whole thing. It, it's really a perfect... Uh, it, it's a perfect understanding, and um, I, uh, I'm working, I'm in the middle of a book right now precisely on that topic, uh, and so it's something that's on my mind now every day. So, if I read the article further, first of all, I didn't know you were in, a book, in the middle of a book on the topic, so this is kind of a divine appointment. So, um, if I read further, then he goes on to say, the article is long, and goes on to say that the only real way to know God is through revelation. How would you describe, first of all, would you agree with that statement? Secondly, how would you describe that revelation? Well, revelation is, is equivocal. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that, who is this author? Uh, that is a good question. I will dig that up on the top of the, the list here. Uh, Father Georges Florovsky. Oh, Florovsky, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know him, oh, okay. yeah. I, oh, of course, yeah. I've read, he's kind of uh, uh, Orthodox Philosophy 101, and, and we yeah. all have to cut our teeth on him. Oh, there and, you go. And I was going to say Vladimir Lossky, but the two of them are so similar in many ways that it's very easy to get them mixed up. Uh, revelation is equivocal because um, the 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 um, the synthesis of all the Platonic forms is found in the idea of logos. Uh, logos is the second person in the Trinity, as he is manifest, so to speak in nature, holding all nature together, giving it its lawfulness and its regularity. Um, he's not identical with his creation, but he is the immaterial lawfulness and regularity of that creation. As far as I'm concerned, uh, that's as much revelation, although in a very general sense, as the written words of Scripture or the miracles of, of the saints or anything else. So... Um, I, I, you really have to define what revelation is and what specifically you mean. I think there's more than one. Uh, more than one type that, of. Yeah, more than one type. Of, you see, my my book is about this. Um, I've never tackled, although my my doctoral dissertation was on this, more or less on this topic, uh, the philosophy of science. But the the big issue is um, the complete rejection of nominalism as a metaphysic and as an ontology. There is no connection. It is no way that a Christian can be intelligently or consistently a nominalist. Uh, and nominalism, in my opinion, is one of the great sources of evil and death in the world. So uh, my book, and the working title is The Ontology of Hell, um, The Church Fathers Against Nominalism, or Patristic Philosophy Against Nominalism, or something like that. Uh, nominalism is the philosophy of reality after the fall of Adam and the um, the corruption of nature. 
if you could dig a little deeper and, and, and explore the nature of nominalism a little bit more for our listeners, please. Uh, nominalism is a uh, ancient ontology. It is as old as realism is. It holds that only individual objects exist and that there are no uh, universals, there are no essences, there really is only the object as such and uh, a name that we give it, which is arbitrary, and from that it get, gets the word nominalism. Objects are only names, universal things are only names. They have no, a universal uh, or an essence has no reality. Uh, and the, the ancient church fathers vehemently attacked this point of view, and it only showed itself um, in Christianity uh, in the high middle age, the, the later high middle ages, a uh, Franciscan monk named William of Ockham, uh, who, who kind of redeveloped and reintroduced this idea uh, into, into the Roman church. And uh, it, it never... It never had a um, a foothold in ancient Christianity, and is vehemently denied not only by the Church Fathers, but you see it in the first uh, few chapters of the Gospel of John, where this kind of thing is, where the Word is really a part of the natural order, mm. uh, the, or, the, or the regeneration of the natural order, I should say. So the Logos is both the the uh, formal cause uh, and the final cause of all created nature. So that's the concept. Um, uh, the point is, is that a nominalist does not see any necessary connections among natural objects. They may mm. be accidental connections, cause and effect, accidental, but those are not necessary connections. So, so you're, you're really looking at the, at the, the nominalist and the anti-nominalist, if you will. That's because we're, you don't want to fight something that you hate and give that a name, I guess. But, um, as, as, having a completely different uh, uh, view and understanding of the entire creation then. That's precisely correct. So on the one hand, it's very specific that I'm only dealing with one school of ontology. On the other hand, it's very general because we're talking about the entire cosmos. Uh, and the view is either the entire cosmos is one organism held together by logos, or it is a random connection of objects banging into each other that have no natural or essential connection one with another, with the exception of cause and effect. Those are two completely opposite ways of viewing the world, and what's significant is that it is the official metaphysics of technology, it is the official metaphysics of Kabbalistic Judaism, it is the official metaphysics of really, you know, the modern a bureaucratic, state-centered, uh, corporate-centered world. And so that's why it's called, you know, the ontology of hell. This is mm. demonic, demonic way of understanding nature. And because there are no essential connections among objects in space, um, the regime then recreates that and then creates its own essential connections between objects and that's the artificial uh, artificial world of machinery uh, that that we that we live in so it has political and social implications so we're, we're drawing a kind of line here and I hope the listeners are able to to follow what we're saying we're, we're kind of drawing a line between um, between uh, Protestantism and perhaps some elements of the Catholic Church and capitalism, aren't we? We're, we're sort of saying because essentially capitalism is is I'm I'm driving a uh, I'm driving an ideology and a view into the universe, even against the natural flow of the universe. And this is very much supported by Protestant thinking, as I'm reading. You're absolutely correct. There is no such thing as Protestantism without nominalism. Uh, <laughs> Protestantism came into existence explicitly stressing. Uh, the um, sort of the dead nature of creation, completely abandoned, and then God as something relatively distant uh, from it, completely, totally unrelated. And so the Protestants then accused us, or me, or people like me, of being pantheists, mm -hmm. because we see we see logos uh, present present in nature. So there really is this, uh, uh, and then of course you know capitalism developed heavily in in Protestant countries. Now, I think there's a very good reason for that. Mm. 
well, we, we'll probably address that in our in our next program in a month or so. But uh, if we if we get to that now, uh, Father Matt, if you um, it, it, uh, where I'd like to go is to is to look at what an Orthodox ascetic. How, how, first of all, who, what sort of people they were or what they did and how this understanding of the universe drove them to their, to their times of contemplation. Right. It's completely identical. There is a, uh, there is a, a, a clear line from how you view the world to how you live. Think of it this way. Um, the, the, the Orthodox Church in its, in its truest philosophical manifestation has no use for the debate over faith and works or the, the, the Protestant reaction to indulgences and how created grace or grace is created and then kind of thrown into people in purgatory like a baseball and then it you know it hits you and you and you get years taken off. I mean that's the reaction. That's the Protestant reaction. Uh and and um and making fun of that doctrine which deserves to be made fun of. Both um, are uh, you know, the, the Roman Catholics by that particular period of time had so long deviated from the ancient tradition that that there was really nothing at all, and, and they had gotten to that level of extremity where the papacy truly was the full manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and therefore um, uh, the papacy was the source of grace that can then be used and applied to various people. So orthodoxy has absolutely no use and has doesn't even use the vocabulary of faith and works in that you know 16th century 17th century way. Mm-hmm. Think of it this way: um, when Christ was transfigured and then was resurrected, he recreated Eden. He recreated paradise. And brought the church, or the, in fact, the church is is Eden. Uh, Eden in the Old Testament was a temple, a natural temple, but a temple, uh, and it was recreated. Heaven is here now. Heaven, in the true sense of the word, in, in the sense of the recreation, the um, fixing, so to speak, of nature that had long since fallen. It's present. It's here. Now, the problem is, why don't we see it, and how come we can't seem to have anything to do with it? Uh, And that is the nature of the ascetic life. What you are doing is that you're not denying yourself different kinds of comforts and pleasures because you're making something up to God, as the Catholics would say, reparations. Um, You're not doing it uh, for, for that reason. God doesn't really need any of this. He doesn't require that we, you know, don't eat meat, you know, f- m- sure. during Lent. That's mm-hmm. silly. A- and yet you do have some of that in the Roman church. But this is what you do because God is demanding this out of those who, uh, and our suffering is a way to make up for the, the, the ignorance of, of others. Yep. And being a Roman Catholic for a long time, I mean, you know, it took me a while to get rid of this, of this concept. It's very, it's like a court system. It's, it's the penal law. Uh, you, you you get arrested for a crime. You got you got to do uh, your purgatory stint, which is your time in prison. But then you also have to to fix or replace whatever it is that you destroyed. Mm-hmm. The whole thing is based on this idea of reparations. But instead, what the Orthodox ascetic is doing is he's preparing himself, sort of lightening his mind, such that it can experience to a greater and greater extent. This Eden that has been brought to earth in the church. Mm-hmm. That's the point. That's the point of the icons and the incense and the spiritual reading and the fasting and the liturgy and all the sacraments. That's its only purpose. It's, so, it's, that's, yeah. it's, you understand what I mean? It's, it's getting you ready, preparing you so that you can experience to a greater and greater extent this divine light, this Eden, this logos, the recreation of matter. Uh, into back what it used to be prior to the fall. Mm-hmm. Now, the uh, by the time of the Reformation, um, uh, had the Catholics institutionalized the ascetic lifestyle in 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 the uh, in the monasteries. The the monks were they if you were a monk you were an ascetic uh, because that's that's something Luther hated and and, and um, Luther loathed the monks. Is that? Did he see that was was the the so-called Catholic ascetic lifestyle as completely corrupt by then? In your opinion, 
Well, I, I don't know about completely corrupt in terms of its uh, how these people lived and, and, and how they how they functioned. I think that's probably, the probably too yeah too pointed. Right. Question. You go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah. The liturgy had been rewritten by that time in the Western Church. They weren't doing the ancient uh, Western services. Uh, they had radically changed a lot of aspects of of the Benedictine rule, which was healthy at one time. Uh, their their theology had changed radically. And they had adopted this thing that you, you do this sort of mortification for the sake of making up for your previous sins. Yes. And more generally, those in purgatory. And I'm here to tell you, I mean, 20 years of obsessing about this stuff, and I came to one conclusion. The issue separating the Roman papacy from the Greek and Russian churches, and the church fathers for that matter, is the doctrine of created grace. The doctrine mm -hmm. of created grace is the heresy of heresies. It is the vomit of Satan in, in Europe and, and the church. You can't make any sense of Roman Catholicism unless you have mastered the idea of created grace, and it's the very opposite of that recreation of Eden that I just uh, explained. Well, well, no, that's interesting. So you, now you better define created grace. Okay. Did you ever wonder why the filioque was such a big deal to the to the to the Greeks? No, I never. No, I, I mean, I well, most wondered. people most people have no idea why. I mean, the Greeks were ready to die for this. Guys, can I ask you a quick question? What was that word you just said, and what does it mean? Filioque. You don't know what the filioque is? Uh, you you lost me there. The filioque was the, when the papacy added the phrase. Um, um, and the son, filioque, hmm. to the creed. Hmm. I've, read, um, I've read about it, but I, but I often wondered why the why the conflict. Well, you know, this is this is something. You know, Protestantism is rebelling against the papacy. Yes, and the papacy is based on the filioque. filioque. Mm. Uh, now, now, hear me out. Mm -hmm. The part of the creed is about the Holy Spirit. And the creed says, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The addition of the filioque there was the battle cry of the Greeks against the Roman Church. Now, most people, uh, they, they say, I have no idea how that little phrase can cause such a war that's still going on and I'm, rip Europe I'm, into two pieces. I'm in the most people category, uh, Father Matt. I'm one of them. Okay, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and this is why the papacy developed the way that it did. If the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, is a product of both, and the papacy in Rome is the vicar of Christ, not just the vicar of Peter, but officially as the vicar of Christ, then the Holy Spirit proceeds from the papacy. Ooh. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, wow. There's no avoiding it. There's no avoiding it, and this is why references to the Holy Spirit were removed from the Western liturgy, specifically in the so-called epiclesis, where when you're when you're um, saying the prayers over the bread and wine, where you actually call the Holy Spirit down to actually affect the change. That was removed. Lots of liturgical references to the Holy Spirit were removed during this period of time, starting with the Gregorian reforms in the 11th century, uh, Pope Gregory VII Hildebrand. Now, when you hold the filioque, you're saying that Christ is productive of the Spirit. But, of course, if you're the papacy and you essentially are the manifestation of Christ on this earth, well, then the Holy Spirit must proceed from you. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where created grace comes from. And even people like Luther weren't able to get their head I mean, he, he knew that it was a problem, but he didn't know how to explain why it was a problem. And he didn't understand. He had very little contact with the Greeks, although I, I do believe he tried to contact the Greeks once. Um, but this is, you know, the Turks were a big problem, and they had occupied that part of the world. It was very hard for the Germans to do that. But mm -hmm. the point is, once the papacy began to claim that it was, in fact, productive of the grace that's normally associated with the Holy Spirit, very quickly you have purgatory and indulgences. 
and all right. of these things, because essentially what the Pope is saying, so to speak, is that he can take the grace of the Holy Spirit like a bucket of water and then give it to anybody who he wants. Mm-hmm. And there's no concept of indulgences unless you have that point of view. Now, you think of it as the complete opposite of what I just explained relative to the recreation of Eden on this earth. Grace is uncreated. It is the perpetual, singular presence of the divine energies, different from the essence, from the divine energies on this earth, present, unchanging, it's created by no one. It is as old as God is. And the bishops and priests and the average people of the church, you know, we have no control over it. We simply, you know, a priest or a bishop really only guides people in how to experience that already existent, total, full presence of the grace of the resurrection better and better every day. That's what the whole church is for. Everything you see and hear in the church and the services and every conceivable area that we that we have in a church, it's for that. It's to bring us closer to experience the already existing fullness of paradise as it exists on this earth, the, the church, which is, so to speak, uh, the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Mm. I, I, I don't want to say that it is the incarnation. of the, I, I don't believe that. But metaphorically speaking, it is, and it functions as if it's a, the, the uh, incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Don't go away because there is more on the Orthodox Nationalist. This is VOR, Reason Radio Network dot com. The concern was that they couldn't put in place the kind of reforms to satisfy investors, to satisfy creditor demands, and so the governments were changed. So that's a big question. Also, what does this mean for everyone else? As we could head towards what Christine Lagarde just is warning today could be a lost decade for the global economy. Here to talk about all of this is former White House economic advisor, Doug Campbell. Doug, thanks for being on the show. It's nice to see you. So, nice to see you. Yeah, first question, because just as recently as this summer, you were helping to prepare the President of the United States' daily economic briefings. I know you have opinions over what should be in them, things that were taken out of them. If you were preparing them today, what would you think was the most important thing for the president of this country to be aware of as he's dealing with all of this? Well, I, I see this. The problem in Europe is, first and foremost, it's a crisis of growth. So I would focus on two key numbers. One is how much the European economy has grown over the past four years. And, and over this time, the economy has contracted by 2%. The second number I would focus on is the European Central Bank's key short-term interest rate is now at 1.25%. So in short, monetary policy in Europe is too tight. Uh, there's a very simple resolution to this crisis. And because there's a potential, if Italy fails, uh, there's a potential for a layman-like event uh, to trigger international financial calamity. Um, so the White House really does have a special role and responsibility to put pressure on the Europeans, and especially the European Central Bank, to provide more monetary stimulus to the European economy. They should be doing three things right now. They should, first of all, cut their short-term interest rate from 1.25% all the way to zero. This might have been enough had they taken this action in the summer, but because they've waited, they need to back this up as well with a large program of quantitative easing like the Fed has done in the U.S., perhaps two trillion euros, mm -hmm. with the idea being that you need to uh, – the doctrine of overwhelming force, mm -hmm. the larger the package is, the less likely it is that it'll, it will need to be used. The third thing that Europe needs to do is to uh, – the ECB needs a larger inflation target. The, the higher inflation is in Europe – 
the more those past debts, uh, debt in Italy is 120% of GDP. Mm -hmm. If inflation is zero or 1%, uh, which the core inflation rate in Europe now is, then these debts are more difficult to pay back. Okay. Um, let, let me so get in it, here and ask you this, though, Doug. Okay, let's, let's kind of break this down. If you're saying that interest rates should be cut, and they're already low, let's you know be honest here, why should savers pay for these... Let's return to the Orthodox Nationalist, hosted by Matt Johnson. Back to our main topic then. The, the ascetic lifestyle is one that first of all sees the interconnection of everything. It is, uh, um, uh, it, it, it does not, it, it sees everything from a rock and a tree and a thought and everything to be overlaid with this and plugged into this um, uh, this divine stream of the presence of the infinite, but it really is the presence of the grace of God. Yes, no. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you are, that's that's an excellent way of putting it. Essentially, it is all one object. Very, it, it's essentially this this community of natural relationships, from you know a black hole to an atom. It, it's really all one in the same substance. And as a monk develops. Uh, in in the ascetic life, and it usually takes. I mean, there is no quick fixes here. It takes decades, a lot of hard work, um, under the guidance of an experienced elder, someone who's done it already. Um, you slowly stop seeing nature as this random set of qualities, you know, colors and smells and everything mm -hmm. else, and you start seeing the form of these objects. You start seeing what these objects are in eternity not as they appear to us right now. Think, think of it this way. An ordinary person like me sees a beautiful woman, and being a normal heterosexual man, my first thought is to desire her, because I'm a normal man. Uh, I'm not a, a homosexual freak, and, and so I desire this woman. Now, a monk, and I see, I, I look at her, and all I see is skin. I see, I see shape, I see uh, how she walks, I'm seeing the, the, the most superficial of appearances. Um, you know, and, and it's nothing. The intellect is not what's provoked here. The intellect is the last thing that's provoked here. Mm -hmm. It's an inherently false, sinful, deathly um, approach to the world. It is to falsify the world. When a businessman looks at a forest... He doesn't see trees. You know, he sees timber. He sees land to sell. He sees himself with a condo in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. All of his passions are provoked, greed, money, in the same way that my passions are provoked when I'm at the mall. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the exact same thing. A monk in his development doesn't see this. The ultimate test of real monastic perfection is when you see this beautiful woman and you don't see those things that provoke the passion, you see the form of Logos manifest in these qualities, holding it together as a singular unit. It does not provoke the passions or the hormones. It provokes the intellect and the spirit. Now, I'll probably never get to that point uh, in, in spiritual development. But the saints have gotten to that point. And, you know, one of the things is, is you, that, that the curse of Adam is reversed in these people. Is one of the things you read about the lives of the saints, and what they could be from Armenia, they could be from Arizona, they could be from Scandinavia, and they have a lot in common. One of these things is that the animals are no longer afraid of them. Mm. This has been the case. This is in the case of the monastery of Platina, California, right now, Northern California. These guys, once they reach a point of, of this kind of ascetic perfection, nature is not this alien force anymore. Mm. You know, squirrels and deer come right up to the place, and they, they act like we're just another part of, of the natural order. But, of course, me and you go wandering out into the mountains of northern California, and we're going to be bit by every rattlesnake, and it's just going to look like, 
you know, this terribly uh, oppressive place. Mm. But yeah. this is the yeah. difference between seeing the external world as a set of appearances, these forces, cause and effect, versus seeing them as the home of Christ himself, the, mm. the person who helped create um, uh, the natural order in the first place, it gives it its form, but also gives it its purpose. And you, need, you, you know, of course, the scientific mentality can't see any of this. The scientific mentality only sees forces and violence and cause and effect. Yeah. And no yeah. connection, there's no natural connection, there's only this, this accidental connection that's connected with various theories of, of the origins of matter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how long, uh, and again, as you said, you, you can't measure it, because only God knows the heart of the monk, only God knows the heart of the diligent seeker. But some of the saints who, who sought to get to this place, was it something they accomplished in 50 years or 30 years? Or I know it's, in a sense, it's a dumb question. I'm just trying to get my head around it. Right. Well, you know, it's not a dumb question only because you have a lot of these Eastern gurus and a lot of these phony Christians who promise this kind of holiness overnight. Yes, yes. Uh, and, yeah, there's nothing could be more fraudulent than claiming that. I mean, we're so steeped in our stupidity. We're so steeped in this sin. Uh, these desires, these passions to grab and to have anything we can get our hands on that might make us feel strong or 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 feel good or whatever. Uh, no, it, it's it's a lifetime of constant struggle. And the fact is, is that every one of the saints, as they uh, you know, got to old age, um, are absolutely convinced that they are the worst sinners that God has ever created, and no one else has ever sinned as bad as I have. Even though, as far as anyone can tell. These people haven't done anything wrong in 30 years, and yet, and yet, from their point of view, because they have reached such a level of spiritual advancement, they see everything they do as sinful. They, they receive such a level of intense self-knowledge, uh, and they experience God directly, they see themselves as, as nothing but clay. But this is why, this is why these people usually can, they're clairvoyant, they, they know what you're going to say to them before you say it, because they're not seeing nature as these obtuse solids. They're seeing mm -hmm. nature as a fluid entity with God uh, as sort of the, the hub and the natural order as, as the spokes. They're seeing it as a fluid entity, um, where me and you, we see it simply as this hard material thing uh, that's, that, that's our oppressor. In essence. Yes, un unyielding. We have to yield it. We have to form right. it into what it has to be. N now, uh, obviously, uh, uh, people who who have this view of nature that you're talking about, they still have to bake bread. They still have to um, uh, to chop firewood and um, and, and build things. Uh, so, uh, in, in some respects, there are many common tasks. But you're saying there's a different approach to those tasks. It should be noted, I think, that, that the monastics, particularly in the West, you know, these are the institutions that colonized um, the great, you know, the great European civilizations, Ireland and Britain. You know, the, the wastelands and the forests and the marshes, these were drained and, and recreated by the monasteries. These people created uh, Western civilization after it had collapsed completely after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Mm. And, and, and they did it really because they have a very tightly knit community. And they have very simple wants and needs. And I've never met a monastic organization that hasn't had a green thumb. And I think that there's an energy, there's an energy, there's a grace that comes from these people that changes the way nature reacts to them. Um, I, I know, for example, that you know, if you if you play heavy metal music in a uh, in a greenhouse, the plants will suffer. They, they won't. They won't. I mean, this has been done too many times. It's a fact. The, the vibrations. It's a distorting manipulation of the air and, and it does it kills plants mm. and yet and yet vivaldi will do just the opposite yep. you know, the gregorian chant will do just the opposite i think it's similar here that these monastics are able to channel this kind of very proportionate uh sense of of, of their own energy and and can make things grow better than we can <laughs> and they don't use chemicals yes well there you go yes they work work with it know how it functions and so on Right now, this brings me now to the um, uh, to the question of providence, or um, um, it, in a very brutal way, it, it Western thinking is 
if I have faith, God will do this. In other words, something that I am thinking, doing, acting, some spiritual activity will cause the Almighty to respond to me. Right? And, and, and uh, I know that's a very vulgar way of saying it, but tragically, that's the way the West, I think, Western Protestantism, particularly evangelical Protestantism, views the world. Right. How does the Eastern ascetic, the Eastern church view God um, acting in the natural realm. I'm going to use the word providence, but I want to use it really carefully because a Western, a Western use of the word providence and the Eastern is different. Is it the right word to use in this discussion? No, I, I don't mind it. I, I think, I think, you know, this is why I made such a big deal as saying that I can't understand Protestantism without understanding this idea that man is radically separated from God. Uh, uh, Christ, Christ is now in heaven. He is <coughs> not a part of the earth anymore. Uh, the Trinity exists uh, up in heaven somewhere, and we have to, you know, we pray to Him. We want something, and and if and you know, and in America, when we don't get what we want, we hate Him. God is our cosmic, <laughs> God is our cosmic vending machine, and if we don't get if we don't get what we want, we get upset. And it's really a stupid idea that when you pray, you ask for things. You you go to God the same way you go to to uh, to uh, um, uh, try to get a plea bargain from a judge. Uh -huh. And it's this really this separate, you know, it, it's it's this radical nominalism that holds it. We don't have any real connection with God. Uh, the Bible is probably the only real object we have that gives us any sense of what God was. But other than that, we don't have any essential uh, connection with with God in any ontological sense. And um, the, the Eastern tradition, the ancient patristic tradition, understood the cosmos as being a singular unity held together by logos. Uh, and, and, and we don't pray. I mean, you know, prayer is a very broad term. It has to do with anything that we do uh, relative to our relationship with God, which, you know, is supposed to be every single aspect. We don't separate it from anything else we might happen to do. It's always there, and it's always present. And we are, so long as we maintain faith, we are precisely where uh, we're supposed to be. And we don't treat God as this as this person that we go to and we want something. Uh, we we simply have the peace, we have the peace of mind to accept what we're given as an integral part of what it is God wants us to become, and that's it. So, so um, well, how does this? Uh, how do you reconcile? How is that thought reconciled with the need, for example, or is there a need to uh, to pray that God deals with unjust leaders, for example? Well, you have to take the point of view that people get the, the leaders that they deserve. Um, one of my, uh, you know, I, I tell you right now, and, and on a more political topic, I, uh, I'm sick and tired of the average American condemning the government for being in debt. Household consumer debt in America is $50 trillion. Yeah. Shut the heck up. You're yeah. infinitely worse than the government. How dare you condemn the government from doing what you do every day? That's right. Yeah, you read the fine print, or you didn't read the fine print. You signed it anyways, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have, you're have you in no position to condemn your government. You would be doing the same thing. If you were elected to the Senate tomorrow, you'd be out with every hooker in D.C. So don't, mm -hmm. don't you know, it could be all pious. Uh, your sins aren't on TV every night like theirs are. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, people get the government that they deserve. Um, and and I don't think there's any connection between uh, modern yeah. states and medieval states. Medieval political power had nothing, nothing even remotely the way that the way that modern states and modern states control everything. Uh, medieval yes, states. Uh, sorry, I, I I think I misdirected you, Matt. I apologize. I, I wasn't so much talking about that as a specific thing, but the uh, attitude to to praying against an injustice or something that you feel that, for example, the monk, the ascetic, would feel that needs to be changed. And, and certainly it, it, there are things that happen. There are oppressions that come from the outside or there are uh, struggles in a person's life, a sick child, etc. How does the, the, um, uh, the orthodox manner of prayer and supplication before God vary with the Western manner of supplication and prayer? Oh, uh, actually, I knew what you meant. But oh, I wanted sorry. to get I, I wanted to get that out anyway. Oh no! And look on on that point, I'm saying, Amen. You got it. You've got it right. <laughs> oh, I hate Americans. I hate the conservatives as much as I hate the liberals. I tell you, <laughs> they're two vile, hobbyist, sloganeering 
Um, you know, they're, they're nothing. Americans are a swarm of locusts and stretch pants. Hey, now, I'll just remember, Westerners, can, uh, they consist of Australians, too. Well, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, and Canadians. <laughs> so here we are. So, yeah. Uh, we, we... So, you know, I don't, I don't care. No, but I understood what you meant. And think of okay, this pardon way. Me. I know St. Saint, Nikolai Saint Vamilovich says, you know, it isn't as if God doesn't know what it is that you need. But, but from God's, think, think of it, use the metaphor as you being a father to, to a little kid. That's the metaphor that you use. I know precisely what my kids need. I know what they require intellectually and in, you know, in food and clothing and everything else. But it's nice to hear them ask for useful things because they, you know that they're on the right track. God may withhold his grace from us until we go to him. So many people, you know, only come to God when they're completely exhausted and everything is gone and they feel like they have nothing left. And then they finally go to God. Um, and God will withhold his grace in certain circumstances so that we will hit rock bottom. And when we hit rock bottom, we finally realize our dependency on him. And it, it's the same idea. He knows precisely what we need. And I'm, I'm convinced that, that, you know, for those of us in the church, God has arranged our lives in such a way um, so that uh, we, are, we are fulfilling the mission that we're meant to fulfill. That doesn't eliminate free will. In fact, it presupposes uh, free will. But free will without grace is pretty useless. And free will is something that's very, very difficult to gain. Free will is precisely this ascetic life that we're talking about. A will that, that, a will that can choose things without these passionate attachments that distort it. Uh, most people around me, the swarm of locusts around me, uh, they don't have free will. They're driven by a handful of very simple, banal, uh, crass, vulgar, material desires. And if you know what those desires are, you can manipulate the average person very, very easily. And to reach a point where you actually are free and have a free will, that requires a lifetime of ascetic struggle. And this is not only the ancient Christian idea, this is also the Platonic idea. Plato also stressed this idea as, as central to his, uh, his ethics. I've never heard free will addressed that way. I've never heard free will as something that you um, uh, that you aspire to attain uh, in, in the uh, the Western Protestant tradition in which I was raised. By the way, I was born and raised in the Dutch com uh, community and raised in the Christian Reformed Church. Of course, so we were Calvinists. And um, free free will for a Calvinist was always a bit of a thorn in the flesh. But yeah. it was it was that at least you believe you had your choice over eternal your eternal destiny. <laughs> You know, whereas with the Baptists, whether you believed it or not, you had the choice, right? So, um, uh, but now I'm hearing you say that to come to the place in your life where you have free will is a journey. I know very few people, uh, people I know very well, that have free will. Mm. Free will is so rare and is so hard to get. What you're, what you're, I mean, think about what you're claiming here. You're claiming that there is a spiritual part of your person that can completely abstract from everything around us, our past, our friends, what we want, what we don't want, what we hate, and then in this ethereal world can make a choice. Um, that's not something that we're born with. As far as I could see, a baby is born completely helpless and dependent, the very opposite of a free person. Mm -hmm. uh, and free will is something that develops as we, as we grow. But I think free will, uh, at least the way in most people live, is, is a complete illusion. They're claiming that they're making a choice, but especially when we know these people, uh, we see what passions, uh, would it be anger or jealousy or whatever it is that's really driving their, their opinion um, or, their, or their point of view, their action. Uh, free will, uh, again, Plato says this as well as the ancient uh, church fathers who read quite a bit of Plato, by the way. Um, he, you know, free will is a battle. Free will is a journey. It's a struggle. Most people will never reach it. Mm. Most, most people are essentially born to, you know, do bureaucratic repetitive tasks, uh, because that's what they're capable of. 
uh, but there are some others who are chosen out of the mass. Uh, and, you know, Christ makes reference to his little flock, a little tiny group of people that are chosen to live this grueling life of struggle so that one day they actually may be able to see the world as a fluid manifestation of spirit rather than these hunks of matter that we either love or we hate. Now, because if you, if you are raised in an environment of, uh, create, consisting of a world of hunks of matter that smash into each other, and I love that, that's going to stay with yeah. me for life, thank you, sir, um, then, uh, then you see free will as, in terms of my ability to navigate between those hunks, if you will. So yeah. it's always a chaotic world. Uh, it is. Uh, and, and the chaos, when you say the word chaos, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're using a very technical word. Chaos means that there really isn't any intrinsic purpose to these hunks of matter. They just are. Mm. Uh, now, I don't know how any Christian can believe that, but, but, um, but these are, yeah, they're clashing into each other, they're, and they're just individual things. They have no essential connection with each other. Crashing into something is not an essential connection. It's an accidental connection. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so, but that's, that's the nominalist point. That's the ultimate nominalist point of view. All there are are these individual things, and that's all there are. Uh, and, and they don't have any intrinsic purpose. Mm. Uh, the realist view, the logos view, the ancient view is that they create a whole. Now, a, a secular man who wrote at great length on this, although he's very hard to read, is Baruch Spinoza. Uh, who, who was a Jew who got kicked out of the, excommunicated from the synagogue in Amsterdam during the, um, during the Renaissance. Uh, and he wrote very difficult, um, prose, uh, concerning the nature of substance and mode and accident. And he actually took this very seriously and really worried about it. And because he said some positive things about Jesus, he got uh, kicked out of the synagogue. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was a, a Sephardic Jew from Spain. Anyway, the point is, is that this concept, uh, that, Matter and spirit uh, and those states in between form an ordered whole. Uh, the sin of Adam introduced chaos and accident into what had been a perfectly ordered whole. Jesus Christ, in taking human nature to himself, he took a thing, by the way. I mean, he took human nature as an object. Mm -hmm. uh, nominalist doesn't know, it says that there is no such thing as human nature. There's only individual people. There is no nature. Uh, so the incarnation makes no sense if you if you accept nominalism because Christ took humanity as such to him, connected it so to speak with um, with the divine nature, and kind of took it through Hades. Hades, by the way, very different from hell, which is another topic altogether. Um, took it through Hades, preached to all the Old Testament people and everybody else who was just, and uh, uh, resurrected with it, and he corrected it. He eliminated everything. He took nature there. I mean, he didn't just take, he took all of created nature as an entity and connected it with divinity, where it had been separated from divinity before. And uh, so he corrected what had been, what had Adam's chaos entered into it. Sin affects not just how we act, it affects the natural order. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're talking about the monks planting seeds and everything. No, th there is a clear connection there. Uh, a monk is going to farm totally different than someone who works for Cargill because it's it's two totally different two totally different mentalities. Is this coming across here? I mean, I know it, it is coming across. You've got you know you you've got me thinking because I'm <clears throat> I, I'm trying to get to my head around where the 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 Western Church would be in its reaching the lost if it if it understood the world that way because the the um, and especially when you use the monk with the seed in cargo you know because uh, uh, the western church is much more happy to farm like cargo than they are like the monk you know because uh, because of the way we've been disconnected from the natural creation so uh, and i have to say uh, father matt it's a uh, it, it, it's a, uh, an aspect of my own soul that you're touching here, and and so it's a very powerful uh, it's a very powerful program. I hope the listeners are as touched by this <laughs> uh, as I am. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very interesting journey today, and um, and an hour isn't going to cut it as usual, but that's just the way it is. Our world is still turning. We've got things we need to do. Uh, my guest today has been uh, Father Matthew Raphael Johnson. Um, Father Matt, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on with us today. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. And uh, you're going to join us in a um, in about a month's time, and we're going to talk about um, uh, various uh, social theories and economics, if you can. I could handle that, sure. Excellent. Thanks for listening. The Orthodox Nationalist returns Thursday evening, 9 p.m. Eastern U.S. Time. Join us at ReasonRadioNetwork.com.